Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be sitting here with Dr. Walter Longo, who's a professor of gerontology and biological sciences at the University of Southern California. He's also director of the Longevity Institute. Dr. Longo has made huge contributions to the field of aging. He has made uh, significant contributions looking at the effects of fasting and other diets um, in the role of human aging and lifespan and biomarkers of, of health span, as well as looking at other metabolic fasting therapies for the treatment of human diseases. Eating, eating within a certain time frame and eating two meals a day actually is what, what I do. I, I eat, I usually try to eat within a 10 hour yeah. uh, and I fast for about you know, 14 hours. But I'm really interested in um, the autophagy benefits and in the stem cell, you know, being able to, to make more hematopoietic stem cells. And I'm wondering what a human would have to do to, to get, the, like, is my 14 hours of fast every night doing that? Or do I have to do a four day prolonged fast, which I can't, I mean, I wouldn't do that, like, unless I had some sort of supervision or possibly this fasting mimetic diet, which you mentioned, you've shown in several different studies in many different ways mimics fasting. And it's this low sugar, low protein, high fat diet. So, um, you know, is that something that yeah i think um there, there are different advantages i mean there's obviously some overlap so i would say if you're on the perfect diet which is a vegan pescatarian diet low protein high nourishment and then like i like it, i do all this like two meals a day 12 hour restriction which and then the the rest that i just said if you're on that you're not going to need as many fasting mimicking diets right um, but the fasting mimic diet uh, uh, send, um, uh, pushes you into a, a mode that you don't normally get be, uh, with all these interventions. Why? Because overnight, you, most of that 14 hours, you got some glycogen uh, to burn, right? So, so you're not really needing to do much of a switch to anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Uh, and, and, that's, and I think it's good. You know, it shouldn't go over that. Um, because it's just a continuous thing. You know, you don't want to push the system too much into these uh, extreme modes all the time. It's different from the fasting making diet because, as I said, you know, the fasting making diet really, uh, by day two of the diet, and only by day two or so of the diet, the system starts switching to a ketogenic mode. You start burning visceral fat as your major source of energy. Your brain starts moving from burning sugar to burning ketone bodies, you know, beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, so, th as I said, everything starts shrinking. The immune system starts shrinking. The, the liver, the heart, the, the, even the oligodendrocytes, as we've shown in our multiple sclerosis paper. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that you're not going to get with anything else. Uh, and you're only going to get it with, um, with uh, this prolonged uh, fasting-making diet. Now, is it possible that if you did uh, some of these things many, many times that this would be equivalent uh, to a fasting mimic diet? Yes, possible. But again, uh, we've seen that uh, we don't know, you know, because theoretically there shouldn't be enough because you're never going to get to to this shrinking uh, and, re and, and rebuilding. But uh, uh, even if it was like that, then I think that um, it'd be, it, it, again, it's hard to change people's behavior all the time. So... We, we, we felt that um, by doing these periodic interventions, is, we got a much better chance of, of getting there. You mentioned the multiple sclerosis with your fasting mimetic diet and also the fact that this diet sort of shifts you to a more uh, fat burning state, which is sort of in line with, um, well, it's definitely in line with ketosis, which you can get from fasting, but also in line with people that are doing a more ketogenic type of diet. And in your clinical study with people with multiple sclerosis, or was it in the mouse? Say, one of the studies you had, I think it was the, the human study. You want to talk about that? You had a ketogenic diet, you had the fasting mimetic yeah, diet. Yeah, we did the same in mice and human, right? So, so it was um, a fasting mimicking diet and ketogenic diet uh, in both cases. And, um, and in, in the mice, of course, we could demonstrate some things and, and these very clear effects, which was uh, the, um, the fasting mimicking diet causes the white blood cells, so the immune cells, as I mentioned earlier, to be destroyed, partially destroyed. And, uh, and then it turns on the stem cells. And when you make new cells, of course, they're no longer autoimmune, right? So the original cells are autoimmune. They're atta attacking the oligodendrocytes in the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. The new cells, we've shown they're no longer immune. And, uh, and this leads to about 20% of the mice being disease-free, right? So 
meaning 20% of mice are cured from, from this um, uh, autoimmunity, which is very much like multiple sclerosis. And um, the other thing that happens is that the oligodendrocytes, with the inflammation, goes down, right? So meaning the general uh, inflammatory state around the spinal cord particularly uh, goes down. And so this is very important because it allows the, the progenitor cells, so the ones that give rise to new myelin, so mm-hmm. they rebuild the spinal cord, uh, they can now do their job and regenerate the system. So now, again, you have, as I mentioned earlier for cancer, you have this coordinated effect, which, which you, you take the bad cells, replace them with the new cells, and then block the inflammation, rebuild the spinal cord. Now you can say, well, this is incredible. This is right. magic, right? <laughs> well, again, it's not. It's just that the body has to have this ability, like you cut yourself. The system that goes to work is incredible, right? Mm-hmm. And um, um, so it's like saying, you know, if I found a way to uh, regenerate part of my arm by fooling the system into thinking that it just got cut everywhere, mm-hmm. right? That's, if you want to see fasting, uh, you can see it like that. And that's why it looks so magic is because um, it, uh, it is an evolved process that has been, you know, been evolving for billions of years. And so it knows exactly what to do to fix a series of problems. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you can see the, the, the wound uh, yeah. as a, as a, you know, in the spinal cord, as you will see as a cut, uh, uh, you would think of as the cut of, in the skin. Um, so yeah. I wonder, I, I had this thought I want to say, but also you showed improve, the p- people with multiple sclerosis had improvements as according to some tests or something as well, right? Yeah. With the fasting mimetic diet and also the ketogenic diet, which... Yeah, and also the ketogenic. Less so with the ketogenic diet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and this is Marcus Bock in Berlin that was the, the lead person in the study. Um, and, but, I mean, the amazing thing is that a week of fasting followed by by Mediterranean diet, which is really a regular diet, uh, did better than six months of ketogenic diet, right? Oh, wow. So continuous, right? Okay. And uh, and, and that's what makes it very impressive. So wait, it was one week of fasting mimetic diet. One single time, right? Five days and then 25 days. Seven days. Seven days. Seven days and then then the rest of the six months, a regular Mediterranean diet. Oh, really? Just one? Yeah. Wow, that is. This, is, this is what makes it remarkable, you know. So now we're we're approaching the FDA, and uh, I think we're going to propose uh, one cycle every two months, um, and uh, you know, so so hopefully that um, for another trial, for another clinical. Well, trial? For, yeah, a much larger trial. Yeah. Is this but, something that um, it, c- it can be available to physicians that are treating people with multiple sclerosis, or oncologists that are treating cancer patients? Because you've kind of you've shown. You know, you've shown that this is a very powerful metabolic therapy that can be used to, honestly, it seems like if, if we're talking about getting rid of damaged cells and replacing them with the new fully functional ones, it can be applied to a lot of diseases. Yeah, there is no doubt. Yeah. So we're now doing mouse work in many autoimmune diseases. For example, we're doing in cognitive uh, diseases. Um, so, um, yes, I think that... Um, what we're saying now to uh, clinicians is the following, and to patients is the following. And sometimes we get attacked for this, but, but I really feel that this is the way to uh, do it, which is um, if you feel, if there is a treatment, whether it's multiple sclerosis or another autoimmunity, um, or a degenerative disease or diabetes or cardiovascular disease, I mean, all these things we tested in some way in clinically. Uh, but, but if you can wait, because there's something that works already very well for you, then wait, right? You shouldn't try something. This is not fully tested, meaning that we don't have a, yes, this works. You only get that when you do 2,000 patients, or you know, I say at least 1,000, right? Um, and then you have to look at the statistics, you have to look at the response, et cetera, et cetera. We're not there yet, so we're saying, if you can wait, wait. Uh, if you cannot wait, because you, know, you have multiple sclerosis and you cannot take it anymore, or you have uh, cancer and you're stage four, or even you're stage one and you're getting devastated by the side effects. So go to your oncologist, your cardiologist, your diabetologist, your immunologist, whatever, and say, I can't take this anymore. This is not working. And of course, there's gotta be a decision made by the, the clinicians together with the patient saying, you know, should we take a risk 
uh, in, in, uh, you know, in adding to this fasting mimicking diet uh, to the treatment. And, and that's, you know, together they have to come up with an answer. Uh, is, it, is it worth the risk? And uh, to some people, it is. You know, we've had uh, some, some people with Crohn's disease um, that said, you know, I can't wait anymore. And they did it, and they did extremely well, you know, uh, after the fasting making diet, you know. So we, we haven't published that yet. But, uh, um, uh, and so I think same for multiple sclerosis and all these diseases. You have to see where you're at. Can you wait? Can you not? Is there something that is working? And they make the decision on uh, is it for now or is it for you know, five years from now? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, uh, Walter. I want to kind of go back to this thought that you instigated in my mind when you're talking about this sort of like wound healing sort of analogy. And that is, um, at least with the hematopoietic stem cells, like I'm not sure about with uh, you know, other stem cells and other tissues, but I know that they, when they're quiescent, when they're not dividing, um, they are glycolytic, meaning they use, they use glucose for energy because they don't want to damage themselves with reactive oxygen species being generated from, you know, as a byproduct of mitochondrial function, right? Uh, but I do know that um, when they come out of quiescence and they come out to either self-renew or differentiate into progenitor cells, they become ox oxidative phosphorylation becomes their source of mm -hmm. um, making energy. And so I'm wondering if there's... You, what the signal, I know you've published um, some studies on looking at different signaling pathways that are required to cause this um, hematopoietic stem cell self-renewal mechanism, but I'm wondering if possibly just not having the glucose available and having just the you know, fatty acids, the source um, of energy that can only be used by mitochondria, if that somehow also is playing a role in making them self-renew more or differentiate more or I think so, and this is the work by David Sabatini and others at MIT, um, and they're doing work on the fat and the role of fat and fatty acids, et cetera, on, uh, on self-renewal and, um, and on the activation of stem cells, particularly in the gut. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, there is, seems to uh, be a role for, for fat in, um, mm -hmm. in, in that, and I think it's still... Uh, we're still beginning to understand uh, understand it. Um, I think obviously, with fasting, you produce fat, and you produce fatty acids and and glycerol and and um, uh, ketone bodies. So the environment is there, and and uh, you know we um, we need to maybe understand more how each component that is changing mm -hmm. is affecting the program. Um, so yeah, so we we made the decision to try to, I think things are going very slow and we've always been very interested in people that have a problem now, right? Instead of, right. you know, <laughs> a lot of people are like, well, you know, in 20 years we'll have this. And we always said, you know, there's people that have cancer now, they have multiple sclerosis now, so what do you do for them, right? And uh, so our decision is, has been always uh, understand enough the mechanisms to be able to not, or minimize the chance of making mistakes. Um, Get to the disease, get to the clinical trial, and then go back and fill it in, right? Mm -hmm. Rather yeah, than yeah. rather than step by step by right. step by step, you know, and then it'll take you 15 years to get right. to the clinical trial. So yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm not I'm not criticizing the other method, but I'm just saying that that for us has been uh, get the mechanism, get enough mechanism, move to the clinical trial, um, and then make sure it's safe. It's been fantastic. I mean, you've been able to translate so many different studies. I mean, it's really quite phenomenal. I'm just sort of thinking, in fact, I just thought about it when you were mentioning the ketone bodies too. Well, ketone bodies are, are a more, if you think about the stem cells and if, if they need energy to differentiate or self-renew, ketone bodies would actually provide, provide a very uh, energetically favorable source because it takes less, en less oxygen actually uh, to, to convert um, beta-hydroxybutyrate into acetyl-CoA as opposed to glucose into pyruvate. So if you think about it, it's more energetically favorable to, um, to have ketone bodies. And so maybe it also helps just because there's, it takes less energy to, to do this process. I mean, you know, it's possible, but. Yeah, I know. think it's also, there's also mechanisms. Uh, again, the, the fasting um, imposes this new metabolic yeah. um, profile and the new metabolic profile requires the um, stem cells uh, mm -hmm. for this regeneration that I mentioned. So if you 
if you got to get rid of half of your liver, let's say that you fast for a month and a half, right? Um, then you must, um, pro- you will produce tons of fatty acids and tons of ketone bodies. And that environment is going to require uh, the stem cells to be uh, renewing and being standing by for the day where you need to make a new liver, mm-hmm. essentially, or half of the liver, right? So this is why I think it's all a part of a, um, a coordinated response uh, where, you know, you have the fat. And, and, and by then, the fat is one of the few sources, abundant sources of energy also for the stem cells. So they really have no choice but to, uh, to be ready to respond to f- fat metabolites uh, so that they can uh, self-renew because there's not much sugar around. And the brain needs the sugar, right. by the way, right? So the brain needs a lot of the sugar that is available. Ma- a lot of it is made by gluconeogenesis. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it makes Red sense. Red blood cells need it yeah. <laughs> since they have no mitochondria. Right. And, and, the, and so it makes sense that you will have a... Um, a, a system like that, uh, yeah. that is fat, fat and fatty acid and, and keto yeah, based. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, not to mention that, like, you know, beta hydroxybutyrate has been identified to uh, be a signaling molecule as well. I think Eric Verdeen's work at UCSF showed it's a class one histone deacetylase inhibitor. I mean, who knows what's going on? But I wanted to yeah, ask you right. about. Um, Back to the cancer and you know this fasting cancer, fasting medic diet and cancer. Um, a couple of things. So. One is, you know, I, th- I think you've shown without a doubt that this, that in both animals and also in some preliminary work in humans, that the fasting or the fasting mimetic diet can sensitize cancer cells to standard of care, whether that's chemo, radiation, whatever, you know, d- death, um, while still protecting the normal cells, which are upregulating all sorts of protective pathways, as you mentioned. But there's this whole other field um, that I'm familiar with, and I'm sure you're familiar with, and that is that cancer cells also upregulate a lot of genes that are involved in autophagy, and they use this as a mechanism to um, help them spread, metastasize. Uh, I know that you know, there, there's a very well-known inhibitor of autophagy called chloroquinone, which is used to you know, kill cancer. So what do, you, what do you think, I mean, I, you know, obviously fasting is way, it's not just causing autophagy. It's like doing, it's, it's this whole, like you mentioned, there's lots of, uh, the sensitizing the cancer cells and the stress response, but all these different things going on, uh, causing the mitochondria to make more reactive oxygen species and all that. Do you think there's some sort of like um, different stage of cancer where this is, you know, autophagy becomes more important, like later in cancer when it actually, that's when the metastasis occurs? Or what do you think of that whole field of, you know, autophagy also playing a role in cancer? I think uh, the autophagy, and I think this was in, uh, um, in the paper that was published together with ours um, by um, uh, Guido Cromer. Mm-hmm, Guido Cromer. And, uh, and he showed, and, and um, uh, Frank Madeo has also been doing work on that, but Guido was showing that autophagy was very, very important during the starvation or using starvation mimicking drugs in causing the um, exposure of the cancer cells to the immune system, right? So, which probably means that um, that autophagy is really part of this weakening and, and maybe death of the cancer cells. Mm-hmm. Um, so, autophagy turns from something good uh, in a normal cell that it does it in a very coordinated way into something bad in a cancer cell, um, probably because it might break down components that are needed. I mean, I don't know, but, yeah. but certainly, um, you know, autophagy seems to be, um, you know, at least for, for this uh, purpose, it seems to be very important. And, um, and, uh, and probably uh, w- um, the desperate, part of the desperate attempt of cancer cells mm-hmm. to get what they need from somewhere. And, uh, and that's what we see that in general, we've seen that for almost everything else. Where, I mean, even independently of autophagy, the desperation seemed to be key, meaning that, for example, they tried to increase translation uh, to get more proteins, right? Instead of shutting down like a normal cell would, they go and try to do things that um, they seem to be desperate. And of course, uh, you can't do that. And, and, or you can do it only for so long. Mm-hmm. And that's probably why they die. Yeah. I mean, it's, 
I know it was something that kind of was confusing to me at first, and then I thought about it for, you know, a, a little more in depth, and, and I thought, well, you know, fasting itself is doing so much more than just autophagy as well, so it's it's not like you know, that's the only mechanism that, you know, it's not that that's a current a biological mechanism that's changing with fasting, so... Uh, but I just thought it was kind of interesting how it seems to be this sort of this opposite end of the spectrum, you know, effects in terms of cancer. But you mentioned fast and me fasting mimetic drugs, or uh, what was it? fasting mimetic drugs or autophagy mimetic? Uh, no, f we fasting uh, mimicking drugs. Uh, so the Cromer uh, had a, a series of drugs. So which that, one? Like, is there? Uh, I forget now what drugs they they had. But for mm -hmm. example, resveratrol is um, spermidine. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are considered uh, fasting mimicking drugs. Um, they, you know, they may not have the power of fasting, but certainly they push the cells in that direction. Uh, they they activate certain signaling pathways similar, that, are, yeah. that are similar to fasting. And, and uh, you know, this is one of the discussions with people that do drugs. I mean, we, um, yeah, yeah you, you have some benefits, but of course, you have also potential side effects. And usually, the benefits are weaker than the ones that you get by right. doing the, the real thing. But that, that's okay. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a reasonable compromise. If you can get some effects, let's say, by giving spermidine to, to cells and organisms, um, and uh, that makes life much easier than uh, having to uh, fast all the time. So, so I think you know, maybe a combination of the, of the uh, pharmaceutical intervention, once we know that they're very safe and they're very effective, together with this older type of intervention may be the way to go, you know, but we have to be very careful um, because, again, in the future, and this, I think, has been under underestimated by the aging uh, community, which is uh, to treat somebody sick, um, you can allow a certain degree of toxicity by wh whatever treatment you're giving. But when you treat somebody healthy, really, there should be no toxicity whatsoever, right? Yeah. Because now you just generated, even if it was 1% of the people, they get a side effect. Uh, so in moving forward, forward with these fasting, mimicking diets and these anti-aging drugs, I mean, we work on it ourselves, right? But, but certainly you, have, you really got to get to the point where you say, I know this will never be toxic to anybody. It's tough, right? Right, it is, it's especially in long term. You're thinking, well, yeah. feedback loops, all sorts of things happen. If you're perturbing one system, that's going to have so many consequences because yeah. everything's connected, you know, and how are you going to know 20 years from now? Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, impossible, it's impossible, right? So you love, to, you love to have the 20 years, right? Right, yeah. You love to have the 20 years observation. And for example, this is why metformin now is starting to very slowly move into the candidate position for an anti-aging mm -hmm. drug, you know, near Barzilai and others are, are talking to the FDA about moving forward with it uh, because there is so much observation. But that doesn't mean that even for metformin, where all the observation is for diabetic patients, and given to somebody that is completely healthy, right. that may not be, turn out to be say to to generate some problems that we did not see in the right. diabetic population. Yeah, is, so metformin, in a way, sort of could you, one could possibly say, in a way, it's a di uh, fasting mimetic in the sense where it activates AMP kind one of the signaling pathways that also oh, no doubt, yeah. yeah. Does it? Do you know if metformin increases autophagy, or has that been looked at? Uh, I'm pretty sure it does. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure it does. So. Huh. Metformin seems to, in our view, it seems to be acting more in the sugar pathway, um, and then, but then, of course, it's missing the, the effect on the amino acid pathway, right. uh, or it has a much weaker effect on that pathway. So, but yeah, metformin has got potential. But then again, um, will I take metformin knowing what I know? Absolutely not. You know? <laughs> uh, will I? What take... about when you're 65 or 70? Would you start no taking way. it? No, really. No. Way. Why is that? Well, because. Um, it is, I, I just don't like the, um, I, I, you know, our laboratory discovered the Taurus kinase pathway in aging 15 years ago. And uh, we used to work with rapamycin back in the 90s, in the mid-90s, you know, we, we were working with the cells from, from Mike Hall. But I always said I never want to work, I mean, not never, but I, I really am not enthusiastic working by in blocking something so central you know, in, the, in, in, a, in a cell and its metabolism and its growth, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I think everybody got very excited in the field and started seeing first all the positive results with rapamycin until 
of course, you start getting the negative, right? Part, right? And, and it was hyperglycemia, testicular degeneration, cataracts, and these are probably just some. And I think with any drug that intervenes as such a central inside of the cell, I always say that it's kind of like taking a car that has got a problem and just sticking things into it until you find, oh, the problem stopped, right? It's like, leave the, leave the knife in there, you know, or leave the, the device in there. You know, that's not the way you do it, right? You, you have to somehow rebuild the car in a way that, that uh, works. But pharmacology, a lot of times, or almost always, blocks something. Right. right. It's like, well, when you block that, what happens to everything right. else around it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but, well, it's like, you know, 30 years of all that, let's say, say you, you, you activate the AMP kinase, right? Yeah. And then you change all these things. Well, what happens after 30 years right. of this interference? And then you do it in all the cells. Is it possible that this just disruption of all these normal uh, uh, pathways, it does nothing? I don't know. Yeah. Um, so we prefer, for example, we always prefer to go with where we have human evidence and there are no consequences, and that's the growth hormone receptor, right? Mm -hmm. So we're now developing drugs against the growth hormone receptor. Why? Because we have the Ecuadorians that we've been following for, for 10 years, and uh, Guevara, has been, our colleague, has been following them for, for 30 years, and they're fine. They make it to very old age. They Can you really explain that? So people like, you know, I don't know, the IGF-1 and growth hormone pathway. And right, right. So essentially, essentially um, amino acids, proteins and amino acids control two major pathways, right? One is the growth hormone IGF-1, which is called an axis. It's not really a pathway, but an axis. And then the other one is Taurus kinase, right? So if you have a lot of amino acids, that's, those two are, up, are activated. And both are now widely recognized as very powerful pro-aging uh, pathways. And, um, and so, um, yeah, so the, 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 if you, of course, you could do it by food or you could do it by mutation. So if you take a mouse and you knock out the growth hormone receptor, this mouse will live 40, 50% longer. It's uh, also, in spite, and this is work by John Kapchik and Andre Barkey, and in spite of living longer, um, it, it has much less diseases. So almost half of these mice will get to the end of life with no diseases that are visible, right? So it's really remarkable. And as remarkable, I think, is our work with humans that have the same mutation, the growth hormone receptor. And these people will live maybe a little bit longer, not 40% not longer for sure, um, but they, they have a terrible diet, they smoke, they drink, they really don't watch anything they do. And, um, and in spite of all this, um, they never get, almost never get cancer, they almost never get diabetes. We really haven't seen any chronic disease in these people. In the same households, they get normal diseases, right? So, so it has nothing to do with Ecuador, it has to do with the mutation, mm -hmm. which matches very well the, the mouse uh, data. But um, so, yeah, I, I think that, um, that uh, that is a much better target. I mean, I'm biased, but, but I think having all of it available to us uh, for a long time, and we, 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 picked the, we picked the target that was the least likely to cause any side effects, yeah. uh, also based on, on you know, very long-term human data. There's also human uh, data showing that there's polymorphisms in, for example, the IGF-1 receptor, uh, or that whole pathway, you know, that are also consistent with longevity as well. Right, right, yeah. yeah so, FOXO, there are FOXO, mutations and polymorphisms exactly. in FOXO in the IGF-1 receptor, in the growth hormone receptor, yeah. Right. So all all, those, it's all consistent where, I, I mean, think so, yeah. I remember, in fact, one of my first, exper my first experiments in biology um, was doing, you know, manipulating the IGF-1 signaling pathway in worms uh, in Andrew Dillon's lab at the Salk Institute. And I remember when I saw, you know, when you get rid of that pathway, um, and in these worms, they live 100% longer. I mean, it was like amazing to yeah. me that you could change one genetic pathway and cause a worm to live like like 100% longer. I mean, that to right. me was yeah. mind blowing. Like, how is that? And these are and these are genes that are conserved in humans, nonetheless. So it really makes you think. Well, if this can happen to a worm, you know, what's gonna what can what's the potential for humans? And we yeah. know centenarians have, like you said, foxes. So IGF one. Um, just for people, so that IGF-1 is a growth signaling pathway that um, I don't, and maybe you can answer this question for me. Um, when I think about it for human aging, I always think about too much IGF-1 being, um, playing an important role in cancer, promoting cancer growth. 
um, when, when, I'm studi- when I was studying it in the worms, it was more about not inhibiting this very important stress response pathway, the FOXO3 pathway, pathway, and how that's important for turning on all these genes that are involved in stem cell, making stem cells, and autophagy, and degrading proteins. And it's just like a you know, master regulator of all these like, amazing genes that can help you if you smoke or just help you deal with the stresses of aging in general. Um, for humans, do you think that IGF, that lowering IGF-1 uh, is going to be have a more profound effect on human lifespan via like not getting cancer, or do you think the FOXO, not inhibiting that FOXO3 pathway is just as important? Um, I probably um, it's um, very much connected, meaning that the aging uh, process is the driver for the cancer, uh, both at the level of a cancer cells and accumulation of mutation, but also at the level of the tissues uh, getting more inflammation be more permissive to the metastasis and also the level of the immunosenescence and the immune system getting weaker and uh, and and we know that if you if you have a, a immune deficient mouse the cancer grows a lot faster right. so yeah so then the, the aging process is really uh, and I think most of us agree the, the primary um, uh, driver of the, the age-related disease, which is cancer, and of course all the other age-related diseases. Mm, so yeah, so we always look in, in terms of uh, um, you know treat aging, and then the rest comes. Uh, now, of course, yeah, there are other things that might not be necessarily related to um, to aging. For example, if you have high IGF-1 in the moment where the cancer cell is generated that cancer cell might still love to have a lot of IGF-1 because it helps it prevent right. apoptosis. And so, you know, there could be a dual yeah. role of, the, of some of these growth factors uh, in, in making sure that the, um, that the cancer becomes a metastatic cancer, mm-hmm. uh, that you know, some of it may, may be independent of the aging process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we should probably also mention the good parts of IGF-1. You know, IGF-1 plays an important role in uh, muscle growth, muscle repair, and also it crosses the blood-brain barrier and plays an important role along with brain-derived neurotrophic factor for growing new brain cells. Um, yeah, this is why I was saying the, the fasting and refeeding, right? So during the fasting, the IGF-1 goes down, uh, and so does Tor and that does everything else. But during the refeeding, IGF-1 goes up, mm-hmm. and IGF-1 is the driver of all this regeneration, and most likely, I mean, we haven't looked at it in, in, in depth, but you know, other people have. And so almost in, in a lot of regenerative process, you see IGF-1 uh, being involved. You know, the, and this is why I was saying that calorie restriction uh, will have this chronic effect on lowering the, uh, factors, but never has the, the part B, which is after you lower it, you have to rebuild it, and that's oh, why. That sense. And that's why I think it may be only half of the of the solution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, something else I, that was what comes to my mind as well is um, wanting the IGF one to go where it's supposed, instead of sitting around in your in your you know serum and you know in the bloodstream, but going to the muscle, going to the brain. And I know that it's been shown in humans that. Um, that uh, IGF, yeah, it's been shown in humans that exor- acute exercise, I think it was aerobic, lowers serum IGF-1. And I think it's because it's going to the muscle, also to the brain, because in mice it's been shown that exercise causes IGF-1 um, to cross the blood brain barrier and get into the brain. So that's another good reason to exercise is because now the IGF-1 that you have, you know, is going to the places where it's, you know, it should. Right, maybe. Right, right, yeah, so exercise, obviously, um, there's no doubt that it's very beneficial. And some of it may be related to the fasting, meaning that exercise is known to do damage uh, to the muscle, right? And uh, so that damage, and, the fo- and, and then it's known that after the damage, you get repair. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's also known that the repair is what builds the muscle, right? So, so uh, this may be maybe not as potent as the... Um, as the fasting, but if you do it all the time, mm-hmm. it could be that you have all these this small regenerative uh, processes occurring uh, every couple of days, if you exercise every couple of days, and then you know, eventually those could be cumulatively, could be actually uh, yeah. very powerful. And uh, yeah, so. Particularly uh, in combination with the fasting too. I mean, if you're, if you're gonna eat your, your protein activate IGF-1, then it's good to exercise to make sure it's going to the right place, right? And so it's, 
I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. And in, in the book that I wrote, I, I really talk about exercise um, and the need to exercise to, um, uh, to make sure that <clears throat> some of these uh, restrictions don't end up in loss of lean body mass. Uh, because the exercise, right. especially the weight training, is very important in, in sending the, the signals uh, to the muscle to yeah. uh, rebuild it. And this is really another very interesting thing about fasting, um, which is it, uh, it takes the, the, the energy from the, from the uh, visceral fat, uh, but it also takes energy from the muscle. But then, unlike other diets, it rebuilds the muscle and so now you really, in clinically, we see a specific loss of, of fat, only significant in the visceral area, and then no loss or very minimal loss of lean body mass, right? Because it, there is temporary loss, but then rebuild, right? So it's really interesting. How, and this is why athletes are starting to become very interested in these fasting mimicking diets. Right, because, yeah, there's some guidelines. Because, uh, yeah. uh, because uh, you know, most of our diets will, will, will get rid of... Uh, Water, muscle, and fat, right? Right, and and, then, and you want you want to increase lean muscle mass and decrease fat mass. I yeah. mean, that's or, or at least leave it alone, leave alone the lean body mass, right. And decrease the right. fat. Right. Now right. you have you know you're you're switching to to a state that um, is much more beneficial uh, to your per athletic performance. Yeah. Do you think? Uh, I don't know. Have you looked at whether or not mit mitophagy or um, plays a role in any of this? Because I know that if you're clearing away damaged mitochondria, or you know, mit mit mitophagy or mitophagy, I don't know which one. I've heard both, but um, you're causing once that happens, much like in the in the whole cellular system, it causes my mitochondrial biogenesis. Yeah. So I'm wondering. Uh, yeah. So we're looking at that right now. Yeah. So oh, cool. that, that's uh, that's our current project, and uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, we're. Uh, we're um, optimistic and so. great. Very, very cool. Um, so we talked about so much, Walter. Thank you so much.